Okay, I'm, I'm speaking with a futurist hat on here. I, I, I don't want to imply that I've done a, a major uh, deep engineering analysis of, of what I'm about to talk about, but I've done enough back of the envelope calculations that as a futurist, I'm fairly sure um, that, that something like this is, is within our next uh, few decades. Um, and so the, the talk is going to be in three parts. First, I'm going to try and convince you that a certain kind of machine that I'll describe um, is going to be possible, especially given the capabilities of molecular manufacturing that we just heard about. Um, the second part is going to try to convince you that given that such a machine is possible, that it is very likely to be built. And then the third part is I'm going to try and talk about what the implications of that are um, for things like global catastrophic risk and, and a few other things. Okay, so here's the, here's the machine. You build a little balloon, and uh, my, my guess is that the balloon needs to be somewhere between a millimeter and a centimeter in size. But it has a, a very thin shell of diamond, um, maybe just a nanometer thick. Um, and it's round, and uh, it has inside it an equatorial plane that is a mirror. And the whole business, um, if, you if you squished it flat, you'd only have a few nanometers thick of material, which is, turns out to be fairly important. And why it's, all you, although you could build such a balloon out of uh, um, uh, materials that we build balloons out of now, um, it wouldn't be economical for what I'm going to use it for. Okay, so given that, that we can build these balloons so that the, the total amount of material in a balloon is actually uh, very, very small, you inflate them with hydrogen in such a way that they will stabilize about 20 miles up in the, in the stratosphere. Okay? So you have these little bitty balloons, and inside of them they have a mirror, and they also have a tiny little control unit and just barely enough um, power or fans or, or other actuators to be able to tilt themselves to a, a preferred orientation, okay? Now you make enough of them to cover the entire globe, <laughs> all right? Now, this is why the nanotechnology makes a big difference, because if they're uh, as thick as I described them, you only need about 10 million tons of material to do that. And to, to compare that with, with stuff that we're used to, that's about the same amount of material used to make 100 miles of freeway. This is nothing that, that our technology can't handle, assuming that you can actually turn it into uh, a high-tech gadget of, of the kind I described. Because so you have a balloon, and it's just a balloon, and it floats up there 20 miles, um, and they all have a little GPS and receiver, and, and they can just turn themselves, and that's all there is to it. And that's the machine. Okay, well, what can you do with a machine like this? Well, the machine is essentially a programmable greenhouse gas, okay? If you set the mirrors facing the sun, it reflects all the sunlight back. If you set them sideways, it allows the sunlight to come through. And similarly, for the long wave, long wave radiation coming out on the back side of the Earth uh, at night. <coughs> now, this machine, which I call the weather machine, has a, a radiative forcing capability. Now, now, for comparison, the radiative forcing capability of CO2, uh, as generally mentioned in the, in the global warming theories, is about one watt per square meter. Okay, this machine essentially has a kilowatt per square meter of radiative forcing capability, all right? It completely trumps any natural uh, influence of, of that kind that's out there or that we can imagine, okay? So if you're worried about um, we're all going to die because of global warming, or if you're one of the people who is all worried about we're all about to fall into an ice age, we can fix that. Okay, this is, this is pretty straightforward. Um, the, uh, the second version of this machine is actually even cooler. Um, the, the first version is essentially like a, a sort of a rod logic existence proof of something that, that looks buildable with molecular manufacturing and will do the job, okay? But, but version two is 
you, t you have the same balloon, but inside of it you have a kind of an aerogel that is switchable antenna units uh, with cross links. And so you can, you can tune the thing to be um, an absorber or transmitter of radiation uh, in any desired frequency and in any de desired direction. And if you're really good, um, with any desired phase. Okay, and, and so once you get that, essentially you've, you've turned this layer in the stratosphere into an enormous um, hologram. Uh, and of course the astronomers really hate no, number one because they, they <laughs> screw up the, the vision, the, the viewing and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, but they love number two because it turns the entire Earth into the, uh, uh, a telescope with the, the aperture of, of uh, 8,000 miles, all right? And of course, you can, you can take that light and, and tr change it into any other um, uh, wavelength you want and send it off in any other direction you want. Um, so you can control not only the climate as, as, a, as a single parameter, but you can probably get close to controlling local weather, okay? And we don't come close to knowing enough about the, the whole weather system to be able to, to say exactly what you could and couldn't do. But I'm, I'm fairly sure that you could do things like make, California, uh, make uh, Canada as warm as California, um, or vice versa. Um, you could cool the tropics, you could warm up the polar regions if you wanted to. Um, if you uh, wanted to do solar power, for example, um, you could build a, an array of photovoltaics out in the desert somewhere, maybe. Um, and you could take the area of, of about a thousand square kilometers above it and set the little mirrors in the first version or, or, or charge up your antennas in the second um, to focus the sunlight down onto your, your area. So instead of having to have a thousand square kilometers of solar collectors, you have one. Um, and uh, you've just concentrated all that, that sunlight on it, and it's pretty much free because you've already built the thing to control the weather. Um, and what's more, you haven't changed the, uh, the energy balance any because you're shading all the, the, all the area that, that um, is otherwise under the uh, uh, thousand square kilometers. Um, that gives you, at, at, in broad daylight, um, an energy flux that's approximately the same as a thousand nuclear reactors of typical size. Um, of course, you have to cool the collectors fairly <laughs> vigorously because it, they're not they're not hundred percent efficient. Um, but you know we can do that. Um, okay. So anyway, that's the machine. We have this we have this gadget that that can enter.